Chapter 401 starts where the previous one left off a few years back, with Longi, one of Fifth Prince Subepa's guards, admitting to Kurapika, Bill and Quinoito, that she's hidden the fact that she was actually a Nen user all this time. She then continues to claim that the uh, ability with the snakes, i.e. Silent Majority, does not belong to her and proceeds to activate her Hatsu. Right then and there, no additional warnings, no assurances that she isn't attacking them, no anything. The mad lass just goes for it, counterattacks be damned. It was a good call though, since neither Kurapika nor Bill actually go on the offensive, for some reason. This is one of the two times this chapter where I'm really not sure about Kurapika's judgement. The infant Prince Wobble was in the room, and letting a bodyguard of another queen that just admitted she's been lying the whole time activate her Hatsu was a tremendous risk. Her admitting she's a Nen user could have simply been a condition for her ability, and by not engaging her immediately, Kurapika paints himself as either overly passive, indecisive, or even cowardly. If I were her, I'd definitely think Kurapika was far more bark than bite at this point. Longi goes on to reveal her ability. Transparent words, Moonlight Act. It's a manipulation-based ability in the form of a contract that another party can willingly sign if they agree to the conditions set by Longi. The ability combines a vow and limitation requiring of her to explain everything in advance and without deceit in order to work. If a contract is successfully fulfilled, the party in question is granted power. On the other hand, if the conditions of the contract are breached, the party in question will suffer restrictions. Longi goes on to explain her background and motivation in terms of an old and current true plan. She reveals that she's actually a biological daughter of Beyond Netero. And she's not the only one. You see, Beyond, in a manner reminiscent of cult leaders, convinced multiple high-ranking Kakin officers to let him bet their wives and have the pair raise them as their own. He did so by espousing his vision of and alignment with the world unification under Kakin national policy. Dude cucked dozens of reasonably powerful men by spouting their own national propaganda at them. If that's not indicative of a specialist's bonus to charisma, I don't know what is. Anyway, in Longi's specific case, she for the longest time believed that this was merely a way for Beyond to place his blood relatives in the most important positions in the next king's entourage. Since he fathered the dozens of children who were all inculcated by their parents to enroll in the military academy with the goal of becoming personal guards to a prince, this made sense. This was the old true plan. Honestly, the phrasing of it is just unnecessarily confusing. The new true plan is significantly more sinister. With the cedar and ceremony serving as the trigger, long is up to that point apparently dormant curse seal activated. You see, Beyond placed a curse on the children he fathered in this way, while they were still infants. Or maybe even before that, who knows. As a result of this Nen attack, their aura nodes were open from birth. To avoid excessive fatigue of having their aura pouring out of their bodies, babies instinctively acquire Ten and Zetsu in order to stop their life force from escaping. How many tries do you think it took him before he got to use the just right amount of aura? Because of this, Longi was always at the top of her military academy class when it came to physical exercises while still holding back. This would also mean that she's literally had at least a decade head start when compared to practically all other Nen users her age. Following the seal being awakened via the seed urn ceremony, she visited a renowned Nen user, most likely an exorcist or shaman of some variety, who looked into the curse and judged it to be the most powerful thing they've ever seen, which cannot be exorcised or otherwise cleansed or removed, going on to identify Longi as a powerful cursed offering i.e. someone imbued with a powerful and malevolent Nen that will be unleashed upon her death. There are at least 10 powerful offerings. There are as many, if not even more, weak cursed offerings, who were excluded from the selection and are not among the prince's guards. Now, the issue with Longi's explanation is that she injects it with a lot of her own intuitions and deductions, so it's really difficult to separate what she knows to be true from what she thinks to be true. For example, she knows that she is indeed imbued with a powerful and malevolent Nen that will be unleashed upon her death. She then concludes that this entails offering her life to curse and kill a specific 
target. However, she later admits she doesn't know the exact properties of the curse, confirming that this is indeed her very strong suspicion. See, the reason she's so sure of this is because there are at least 10 powerful offerings such as herself, a number which obviously coincides with the number of Kakin's princes. In her mind, this means that each powerful offering is meant to curse and kill a particular prince, but concludes that this is not necessarily the prince they are assigned to, since her half-sister, with whom she investigated and uncovered all this, was not chosen to be a personal guard of the second prince, who instead promoted her have-nots to the position, about which you can learn a bit more about in this video specifically about her. Since Beyond made no moves to reinstate her, Longy concludes that becoming a trusted personal bodyguard of a prince can't be the condition needed for the curse to trigger. Hell, she thinks that even joining the military academy may not have been a requirement. Speaking of potential triggers, Bill concludes that since the cursed offerings were not informed of their own fate, this means that either A, Beyond can trigger the activation at his own choosing, or that B, he's letting the conditions be met on their own as an additional condition to increase the power of the curse. Kropika believes the second option to be correct, concluding that Beyond wants to ascend First Prince Benjamin to the throne. Longy disagrees with this, dropping another absolute bombshell. She believes that a child sired by Beyond is among the princes. Listen, Longy's mixing of what she knows and what she suspects means that she's an unreliable source of information, so we should take everything she says with a grain of salt. But I really wanted to call bullshit on this, because it really does seem a bit out there. The King of Kakin allowing someone from outside the family to participate in the succession war seemed to me quite unlikely, but we really don't know enough about King Nasubi to judge what is and isn't unlikely for him. This could have been anything from an arrangement Beyond made with him, to the king being aware of what Beyond did behind his back, but just letting things play out, either believing that his own progeny will come out on top, or not actually even caring about whether his own blood ascends to the throne, as long as it's someone capable of leading Kakin into an even brighter future. Then again, maybe he was just into it. He is the king of Kakin, after all. Now that's what I call foreshadowing. Impeccable work as always, Togashi Sensei. Any which way, since the rules for participation in the succession contest are worded in just such a way as to almost explicitly allow for this kind of thing to happen, i.e. that the contest is limited to the children of the legal wives of King Nasubi Huiguro, i.e. entirely regardless of their father, I have no doubt that this is indeed true. Among the princes, there is a progeny of beyond Netero. With all that established, let's now get back to Longy's contract. This one is tough. I've read two different translations and it's difficult to parse some of it, so bear with me. The contract specifies that neither side will interfere with or attack the other's princes, queens or affiliated guards. It will expire at 9am the following Sunday and will be renewed for another week if a messenger from the fifth prince is inside room 1014 at that time. The punishment for breaking this arrangement is one week of enforced zetsu. Karapika immediately focuses on the fact that with Nen, even healing can be considered an attack, making the whole arrangement potentially problematic. Longy retorts by saying that in that case, even the contract itself would be considered an attack, ensuring Kropika that as long as he doesn't actively do anything to infringe on the prince or her entourage, i.e. unless there's evidence of fraud, damage or other action clearly meant to cause harm, the punishment will not trigger. This is still way too subjective and unspecified in my opinion, especially since a week-long enforced state of Zetsu is practically a death sentence at this point. Kropika statement that it's merely pretty powerful or even very dangerous, depending on the translation, are both quite the understatement, and the second thing he stated in this chapter I see as being slightly out of character for him. It's also worth noting that the enforced state of Zetsu is only mentioned as a punishment in case Kurapika or his party break the contract. I didn't really get the impression that it applies to Tubepa's side, which is yet another potential problem. The second facet of the contract is the conditions for its successful fulfillment. To do so, Kurapika and co. must find Beyond's progeny before Tubepa withdraws, or there are only two princes left. If they succeed, Kurapika and co. will be granted power or 
given a boon, depending on the translation. This power or boon is either an unspecified, most likely generic NEN output power-up, or the ability for them to use Longy's ability one time. As I said, the translations do not coincide on this point. What they do coincide on is that in the unlikely case Beyond Child isn't among the princes, the gang will nonetheless receive one use of Longy's ability. She goes on to add a third facet wherein she promises to make a personal contract with them if Tubepa refuses to sign the contract or backs out of it at any point, depending on the translation. With the reward once again being a single use of her ability, if they do track down Beyond's progeny after the fact. She also assures them that Tubepa will not arbitrarily terminate the contract on her end, and depending on the translation, that Longi will not arbitrarily activate the punishment, implying that she could. This part is unclear, so I won't focus on it too much, but she either can or can't activate the punishment herself. It makes far more sense that she can't, both conditions-wise and theme-wise, it is a contract after all, and I don't think there's anyone who'd accept the risk of the contract mediator getting manipulated or coerced into inflicting the punishment, even if there would be a detriment to herself, were she to do so. The seven days that's penalty is way too steep especially now. Finally, Longy reveals the full extent of her current true plan, explaining why she'd be willing to make this personal contract in case Tubepa refuses. If Beyond's child is indeed among the princes, she wants the opportunity to kill them herself. This is what she sees as a final fuck you to her father, who upended and manipulated the lives, dreams and aspirations of dozens of people simply for his own selfish benefit, potentially even needlessly so. Now, as I've said, Longi is an unreliable source of information, and there are quite a few things she stated that seem to be leaps in logic, bridged by nothing more than her intuitions built atop of each other to support her own. Conclusions. She claims Beyond most likely bedded an officer's wife every time a prince was born, but there's no concrete reasoning or evidence to back this claim up. She knows that she is indeed imbued with a powerful and malevolent curse, but asserts it as fact that the targets have to be the princes, based on their number alone which we only know to be more than 10. Her half-sister, who was not allowed to join Camilla's personal guard, and who beyond made no moves to reinstate or at least transfer to another prince, should serve as evidence against her theory. We know that physical proximity is incredibly important when it comes to the efficacy of curses, even when they're powered via post-mortem Nen. So it makes sense that beyond can't make any use of a powerful sacrifice while she is half a known world away. All of this makes me think that while there is almost certainly a child of beyonds among the princes, more due to how the aforementioned rule for participation is worded rather than due to Longy's arguments, it's at least possible that she came to the right conclusion through faulty premises. While it's too early to claim anything with any certainty since we've just learned about all this and I'm still digesting all of it honestly, it's at least possible that the purposes of the powerful cursed offerings is not to kill a particular prince, but perhaps die for the them in their place, should that prince be killed during the succession battle. Remember that the trigger for the curse was the seed urn ceremony. So it's possible the curse became active after the prince they're supposed to be sacrifices for conducted the ritual for participation. If this were the case, then it would make sense why Beyond never bothered to transfer along his half-sister, since he'd already acquired a decent number of powerful cursed offerings on board, and it just wouldn't be worth the risk. This would of course mean that Longi could die the moment she attempted to kill the prince in question, accidentally sacrificing and killing either herself or another powerful cursed offering. One more, quite far-fetched possibility is that the cursed offerings that stay behind in the known world are offerings to be sacrificed to the calamities, possibly instead of Beyond or his men, since the effects of some, such as I and Pap, can even reach the known world. Remember that Kaki needs for this excursion to be successful, or at least not a total failure, so the king may have sanctioned for Beyond to use the seed urn ceremony as a kind of catalyst to kickstart the cursed offerings. But that's just just food for thought. Moving on. Now let's quickly go over who of the princes may be Beyond's progeny. 
On a first reading, I've come up with four possibilities, but hear out my reasoning first. So, we know it's not First Prince Benjamin, that's already been established. I also don't think it would be the first child of any of the higher-ranked queens. So, Second Prince Camilla and Third Prince Zenglei are also out. Twelfth Prince Momose, Tenth Prince Karcho and Eighth Prince Salisale are already dead, so they're out on that basis alone. Out of all the ones left, the following four would be the most obvious or narratively interesting possibilities. The first is, of course, Fourteenth Prince Wobble. As the most junior queen with the least amount of power, influence or future prospects, it makes the most sense that the king would allow Beyond to uh, bed her. This one is a bit too obvious, and I'm assuming, though this may be giving her too much credit, that Longy ruled out Wobble before coming to Karapika with the contract, since the risk of her being the child in question would be a very obvious possibility. The second possibility is Ninth Prince Halkenberg. This based on nothing more than that Longy's features in this small panel looked so much like Halkenberg, I actually thought it was him for a moment. Halk would be interesting since he's currently on everyone's radar and is all but guaranteed to be targeted by big bro Benji very soon. A potential plotline here is one where Longy learns about the true nature of the Ninth Prince and then has an internal struggle on whether to go through with killing him or actually embrace her father's cursed legacy and assist him in becoming king perhaps even betraying to Beppa in the process. The third possibility is, of course, Fourth Prince Terror Sandwich. Him being a nigh unparalleled Nan genius would make a lot of sense if his father was beyond and his grandpappy Isaac freaking Netero. That's as royal a fucking pedigree as any individual could possibly muster. Also, while this is something I had noticed before and noted it as being quite peculiar, I didn't think to bring it up in this context. A Reddit user, to whose post I'll link below, made the connection, so all credit to them. A big visual clue and potential foreshadowing that Beyond and Terror are connected happens when Beyond's discussing the requirements for the Dark Continent expedition with the Zodiacs. One of the things he mentions is the method or means required for the successful excursion, depending on the translation. And we see a panel of terror about to indulge himself in some uh, r and &R. This could mean a bunch of things, but since it wasn't my idea and my time is very limited, I won't get into it here just to know it's there. For the record, I personally really don't want it to be terror, since the bastard already has way too many things going for him. My fourth and final option, which I personally believe to be the case, is Seventh Prince Luzerus. Why? Because his name may be a reference to the biblical figure of Lazarus, who was famously brought back from the dead by Jesus Christ. Since his GSB's ability seemingly has nothing to do with reviving people, if I'm right and the sacrifices are meant to die for and not kill a particular prince, his name may be an intertextual reference to this very idea. The second queen also had the most children, four in total, so it makes sense that Beyond may have uh, slipped in there for a bit. Also, Barshu's become quite friendly with the prince, which may very well pose a problem for Karapika, since, you know, Longi would want to uh, kill the guy. Finally, three quick things. One, I think Bobby Mina is getting close to deciding to engage his N again, perhaps getting worried that he's given Karapika's camp too much freedom. Two, Beyond asked Kanzai to bring someone to him. Neither do I have any idea who that may be, nor do I have the brain cells left to give it any thought. And three, Kanzai's reading knees monthly. What an absolute degenerate. We don't judge here on the overthinker. I uh, hope you found the video entertaining, it was my first ever attempt at making a chapter review. I don't usually do this, but if you did enjoy it, please do share it around, it would mean a lot. I'm very much looking forward to your feedback on any and all things I've said here, so don't hold back. As always, thank you very much for watching, feedback is always appreciated. I'd once again like to thank Kamaswami for going the extra mile in supporting the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.